Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thornhill Baptist Church. Welcome to those joining us online as well. Uh, I see a couple individuals talking to each other, so I want to invite everyone to just stand up and just welcome, welcome your neighbor here. you all to come together to, uh, to just praise the Lord and sing and sing the same. Take us to the river. Take us there in unity to stay. It's all of your salvation. To win this generation for our King. Son of your forgiveness, for it is a grace that river flows. Take us to the river in the city of our God. Take us to the throne Give us this to hear the cry of hell. For that cry is mercy, mercy to the fallen sons of men, mercy has triumphed, triumphed over judgment by the blood, and take us to the throne room in the city of our God. For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the year of the Lord. For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. Take us to the mountain. Lift us in the shadow of your hand. In the mighty angel. Stand aside the ocean and the land. There is not a mercy. The showers are dry and barren place. Take us to the mountain. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the year of the Lord. For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the year. Take us to the river. Take us there in unity to sing the song of your salvation. To win this generation for our King, the song of your forgiveness. For it is with grace that the river flows. Take us to the river. In the city of our God, take us to the river. 
I think it's appropriate for us to spend some time in prayer. So Lord, we are so grateful for the ways in which you draw us to you. We're grateful for the ways in which you you speak to us, and, and may the songs that we sing reflect uh, something in us that we can't always capture with our words, but they just reflect a song in our heart that that um, of the work that you have done, the, the, the work that you're doing, and the work that you will continue to do. And Lord, as we sing these songs, we we call out to you and we recognize that your spirit is here dwelling amongst us and, and is present with us. We ask, God, that you would continue to speak, that you would continue to move in this space, that you continue to move in our lives in, in ways that maybe we can't even fully appreciate or understand even in these moments. But, God, we know that, that you're here. And so we, we turn our eyes towards you and ask God that you would just continue to, to speak to us, that you continue to remind us of your goodness and remind, remind us of your faithfulness and your mercy and your kindness in our lives. Amen. Uh, a couple things just want you to be aware of. First, if, firstly, if this is your first time here, if you're visiting, you're a guest, we're so glad that you're able to join us this morning. I want to let you know that uh, in the pews in front of you are uh, green or blue newcomers that are connect cards. I just want to invite you to fill out one of those cards. You can give it to me after the service if you'd like, or you can put it in the offering basket in the back of the sanctuary. And uh, just an opportunity for us to chat uh, throughout the week. You, can, uh, you might have some questions about this church, and I'd love to chat with you about that. Also want to let you know that if you are, are if you consider yourself a newcomer to this church, so if you have been coming here since uh, last September, if you've been coming here since last September, we're going to do a newcomer's lunch just to welcome you to our church. And uh, so looking forward to that. We're, and so in two weeks, the last Sunday of, of this month, we're going to do a newcomer's lunch where it'll be an opportunity for you to come and you can meet some of the, the leadership of the church. You can hear uh, kind of what we're all about and uh, get, a, get a nice meal as well and an opportunity just to connect with a few folks here uh, with an extended period of time. So that it's not just kind of rushing in and out like we might do after the service, but uh, spend some time enjoying a meal together and getting to know each other a bit better. So, that, so you can put that in your, in your calendars if you're a newcomer uh, the last, uh, last Sunday of this month. I also want to let you know a couple of, about a couple other things. Um, we are, right after the service, we are doing a membership meeting to discuss the 2023 financial audit. And so if you're a member, you can kind of uh, make sure that you stick around after the service and we'll have a, have a, have a vote and a conversation surrounding last year's uh, budget. And then, uh, and then in just under two weeks, uh, on, on April the 27th, there's going to be a ladies' tea. And I uh, would encourage you, if you're a lady, to, to invite a friend or two and to, to come and enjoy the afternoon with the, uh, a group of other ladies. And, uh, and I assume there'll be more than just tea there. Um, if I don't drink tea, but I'm sure that would be good. But, uh, but I'm sure there'll be other things as well. I'm not a very good promoter when it comes to some of these things. So the ladies, it's up to you to promote it. And uh, but uh, so let, let, letting you know that's going to be on Saturday, April 27th in the afternoon. And uh, so that's all the, the, the announcements that I want to give related to what's happening here in the life of the church in April. I'm going to invite my friend Rachel to come on up. And so Rachel's gonna, she uh, going to introduce. She can come up and she got a mic there behind you. So in February, I think it was Rachel, you went on a mission trip to Dominican Republic. Yes. Yeah. Um, could you tell us kind of what you ended up doing there while you were there? Yeah, for sure. So um, uh, from February 16th to the 24th, I went on a short-term mission trip to the Dominican Republic. Um, and that was with the organization Casas por Cristo, which is Houses for Christ. Um, and it was with a 20-person team. And uh, I met them through um, uh, UCM, which is University Campus Ministries, which um, is a spiritual presence um, on each of the campuses of uh, University of Calgary. And um, yeah, a lot of you guys made that possible. So I just want to say thank you so much for your support and your prayers and financially as well. Um, but yeah, we built a house. <laughs> I guess that's the important part. <laughs> awesome. So Rachel, as you, as you think about your experience uh, serving in another culture, very different culture, um, what did you sense God was revealing to you about God while you were there? Yeah, um, a lot of things. I think when I think about it, the 
one of the biggest things is just the idea that he goes before us. And I think that's something that I heard growing up and just kind of thought it was like a spiritual lingo, but I definitely have a deeper understanding of that now. Because um, it's just this huge perspective change of um, my stupidity and being like, okay, so I'm going on a missions trip and I'm bringing Jesus to these people, um, which is just so not the case. Um, it was really encouraging to just go there and see how God has been working in that community and in that culture for for centuries, for decades, forever, right? Like, these people, um, there's lots of Christians there, but there's also lots of non-Christians. But, um, yeah, the organization has been working there for a long time, and uh, God is just working so powerfully there. So that was a huge perspective to this thing. That's awesome. So just kind of bouncing, kind of continuing from your point that you just made, um, as you as, as you were reflecting on this idea that God goes before you, what were some important discoveries that helped you to appreciate how Dominicans worship Jesus I presume that there's probably some differences there than there are here. Totally. Um, that was actually, I think, my favorite part of the trip. I mean, I loved building the house. It was hard work. But we had the opportunity to go to church uh, there in Bisono, the village that we were in. And um, it was just amazing. Like, their, their worship is very different. It's so upbeat. And not that ours isn't, but um, just like... We're the, Baptists. You know what we're talking about. <laughs> the, just like the joy. And I think because it's a different culture as well, they have less concerned for time, and so it just goes on and on and on, and um, yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very communal practice, and there's a lot of movement and stuff, too, and so um, it actually reminded me of uh, when David's dancing for the Lord. I don't know why. It's the first time that I've thought of that, but um, I was just thinking while I was there, like, he must have been dancing to something like this. Like, this is just so joyful. This is kind of the same way I felt like he made me felt. Well, you know, that picture of being undignified before the Lord. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cool. And so as you reflect on your experience, Rachel, how are you different today than you were before you left? Um, well, for one, I think definitely the perspective changed. Um, and I just have, like, such a love and appreciation for the culture, too, like the Spanish language and stuff. I think going into it, just being so open to see kind of what they could teach me, not just what I could teach them and what God had for me as well, um, has just, like, I love it, and I love the way that they worship, and so I think that's opened the door for me as well. I often listen to Spanish worship music now, and I try and learn the words, and I sing along to it. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of that new openness and um, appreciation for God and just, like, how big he is, knowing that he is working everywhere in the world all at once, you know? It's one of those things that you kind of know, but then you just, like, relearn and are amazed by every time. Thanks for sharing that, Rachel, because I think that, you know, as we as a church, we, we've often said that we want to be a church that sends people, and I think that we have often reflected and said we have, we, we have the hope that, that when we send people that they have a different perspective of themselves, the, the world, their God, um, and, and so I, I'm encouraged to hear that because I think that's, what, that's our hope as a church is that when we send people uh, on, on mission trips that, that they would come back with a different perspective on themselves and of Jesus. And, and that would be richer. That be there's a there'd be a depth there that, w- that didn't exist before. So so I'm I'm so encouraged to hear that, and I think we should be as well. Um, Rachel, you have a whole series of pictures that you're going to walk us through here for the next few minutes, and then you're going to teach us a Spanish song as well, right? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to teach you. Yeah, you guys can. Try we're we're quick it. learners, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll try. Cool. Um, so this is our team. Um, yes. So Casas por Cristo. Um, this is our team. There's 20 of them up there. Um, in the top corner there, too, you can see that um, there's a father and a son. So um, University Campus Ministries is run by Kelly Johnson, who's in the top left-hand corner, and his wife. And so um, most of all the young people are university students, but then he also brought along some um, some dads and stuff like that, and his brothers as well. So um, it was basically a bunch of younger girls and some dads and then two, two strong males in their prime, so they have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. But um, our youngest member was nine years old, so that's the son in the top corner, and then 62, so we had a wide age range for our team. And then we had, these are our two guides for the trip. Um, The one on the left is Gus, and he's from Texas. His grandparents started the organization. And then the one on the right is Manny, and he is um, native to the Dominican um, from the village of Sono, so he he knew all the stuff and could translate for us. So the first day, we flew from Calgary and then had a four-hour layover in Toronto um, and then got to the airport in Puerto Plata. And, uh, yeah, that's the, 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 what you can see from the window um, of the airplane when we got to the island. So that was a long travel day. 
and then we got there, and I don't know if you can see, but the bus on the bottom is kind of what they picked us up in, and um, very, it's called the La Wawa, that's the bus, <laughs> and that's all of us on the bus. Um, when we got there, we have, um, the casa was, or the house were, that we were staying in was called La Casa Azul, which means the blue house. And um, we just had a little debrief, and um, then we went to bed really early that night. But uh, the two ladies in that picture um, are the cooks for us, who cooked for us the week we were there, and then that's us helping with dishes as much as they would let us. Can I pause for a minute? Please. <laughs> yeah. So um, you, you may not know this, but oftentimes when, when, um, when the short-term missions uh, hire other people to do some of the work, like the cooking, the cleaning, some of those things. That's a that's an important source of income for those locals that, that we may we don't necessarily realize is really really important kind of an injection of finances for some people that may not have it. So yeah, yeah no, that's very true. Um, and they were so lovely, so hospitable. Um, this was when we got to go to church. Sorry, that last day. If you want to go back then. Um, yeah, so the church is the building there, and then um, we met some of the younger girls there, practiced our Spanish, and um, yeah, it was a big church. There's, yeah, sorry, keep going. <laughs> um, and so it says, uh, Iglesia Cristiana Cuerpo de Cristo, which means um, the Christian church, the body of Christ. Um, yeah, and that was just our worship service, which is so encouraging. Okay, and then after church on that uh, second day, we didn't start building until the third day, um, we played basketball with some of the neighborhood kids. So I don't know if you can see, but the top one is this big um, basketball court that has a covering on it. And we learned later that the pastor that we were partnered with, who we worked with, um, played a big role in getting that um, covering over there because it is so hot in the Dominican Republic. And people didn't often, the kids didn't play sports just because they needed a covering. And so um, that was another big building project. And so, um, yeah, that's the group of us um, that we met the kids. We taught them a couple different games. So those were my crazy facial expressions. <laughs> And then we always have a debrief um, at our La Casa Azul, um, the place we stayed on the roof afterwards, because that's kind of where they have space for us all. Um, and so people take to, to turns leading devotionals, and we did worship, and that's where we learned Here I Am to Worship in Spanish. So, yeah, we'll try singing that after. Um, that's the whole team, and yeah, we just, debrief is such a good time to kind of check in on each other and the team spiritually and see how everyone is doing. Um, so grateful for that time. Day three, um, at 6.30 a.m., we woke up really early, and we uh, packed, we went to the warehouse, we packed all the tools in uh, a couple trucks, I think two, and then we took off to go find the site where we were building. And so this is what we saw when we got there. Um, we just kind of got to take a look at what we were working with. Um, they have a plot picked out, but that's about it. And then we also met Pastor Michelle, who was the one I was talking about earlier. Um, he's doing just some amazing work. So he's not with CASAS, but um, he's the pastor that they're partnered with, who um, interviews the families to figure out which families need houses and who's in need um, and stuff like that. So that was the building spot. And we started um, just chopping up uh, pieces of wood and nailing two by twos or two by fours together and then making the outer rim of the house. Um, and I, so this is just something I heard lots, is measure twice, cut once. So I am not, <laughs> I am not a builder. I've never built a house before, but they were really, really good at telling us what to do. So, uh, yeah, we got lots of practice with that. Then we had to dig trenches around the outside to put the, um, the brace in. And then we got this, like, chicken wire stuff. I, I don't even know the names of these things. But anyways, <laughs> this is what we did. Um, and then it was laying the foundation. And so laying the foundation was the most difficult day of the whole trip. It was the first day, and it's when we did the most work um, because we had to make the cement ourselves. And so what there was was just giant piles of dirt, piles of rocks, and then buckets of water. And so we have two concrete mixers, and um, this is where we needed the, strong, the two strong men on our team. Well, the dads were strong too. But um, they were just constantly picking up these giant pails of gravel and pouring them into the mixers and the, and the soil. And uh, it probably took, I would say, two and a half hours. Do you think so? No. Hour and 15. We were a fast team. Usually it takes a really, really long time. But it felt like two and a half hours. It felt like two and a half hours. It's probably one of the hardest things that I've done. And I look really happy there, but I was just like, Lord, I'm doing this for you. Give me the joy that I need to get through this. Um, 
So that was it was a good time. It was difficult, and that was the foundation that we made, um, which was just such an accomplishment. It felt we were so proud of it after. Um, and then we thought we were done, but they were like, now it's time to build the walls. And so uh, we were all exhausted, but we, um, yeah, we got our joy and we started building the walls and just nail some more pieces of wood together. We put them all against the fence there for the next day. So we just built them and then left them there for the day after that. Um, where we got to, oh yes, so we finished the foundation. That was a big thing for the first day. And then the next day we were building the walls, doing the siding and the roof. So this is our foundation. They put a beautiful blue color on top of it, and those were locals who actually know what they're doing. Um, yeah, and then we started doing the walls and siding. Oh, yes, and always before, too, um, we do devotionals before we started, which was really cool. Um, and as you can see, foundation was a big theme. So it was about how the Lord is our firm foundation. And I think that was just such an awesome ministry because it was to the family as well. Um, for some context, there's a dad, a mom, and three kids. And the mom and takes, tries to take the kids to church, and I think she goes herself, but often the father doesn't go to church. And so, um, yeah, just having the whole family there while we were doing our devotionals was a pretty cool um, testimony, I think. So these are what it looks like when the walls are going up. And then <laughs> doing the siding, um, which is what I ended up doing a lot of the time. And then the roof as well. So we just had to carry it and kind of like chuck it up to the people who were on the roof. And then we did the electrical, if you saw in the last picture too, where there's light bulbs and stuff, so that was a big job. And then last day we did finishing the siding, the windows, the doors, and the electrical. And someone told me I looked like Bob the Builder in that photo, so that's why I look crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, so we finished the siding, and then that is what our house looks like. So, um, crazy building project, but uh, I'm amazed we did it. And then on the day after that, we got to present the house. And so there was a bit of a presentation ceremony to the family. Um, and so it's just this awesome opportunity to get the whole community together. Because even while we were building, like people walking by or people driving by would stop. And they just, they wanted to know what was going on. And so, um, you know, they'd talk to our guides or they'd try to speak Spanish to us. And we'd be like, mm. <laughs> But, um, yeah, and so on the day that we were doing the dedication, it was just like a whole big community gathering, which was so awesome. Um, and they did um, some worship. We sang um, songs in Spanish for them and then also songs in English. And um, Pastor Michelle gave a sermon as well, which was super impactful from the parts that I could understand. <laughs> and so this is a family. Um, the dad there is Agapito. Estefania, or Estefani, is the mom. Miguel is the oldest son. Alonso and Rosamella is the youngest daughter. Um, and yeah, they were just, they were so, so, so blessed by it. So it was really cool to see. And then these are just some of the friends we met along the way. The one on the right over here, um, who I met, she was helping me practice my Spanish. Her name was also Raquel, or like Rachel in Spanish. So that was cool. I think that's everything. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Rachel. Uh, yeah. Let me pray. Let me pray for you. And, uh, and we'll invite the worship team to come on up and they'll lead us in one last song. Lord, we, uh, we're thankful for Rachel, thankful for her willingness to, to serve and to, to engage in meaningful ministry that, that is uh, both practical and, and, and has spiritual layers to it and, and points people toward, points specifically this family, but I think the, the larger community towards uh, the, the redemptive work that you uh, call us as a church into. And, and so we thank you for the example that Rachel sets for us to be people of mission. And, and so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, that you bless her, that you continue to open up doors for her to serve, not just in, in faraway places, but also to be present uh, and to serve here uh, in her local context. Lord, I pray that same prayer for us, that as we consider what it looks like for us to, to serve and, and to be present and, and to meet people where they're at in very practical ways, but I pray that you would um, give us wisdom how to do that as a church. Bless our time now. Bless Rachel. I pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together again as we All right.
great. I'll start in Spanish, and then you guys can try and catch on, but we'll do, um, I think, just a couple of verse, so then we'll sing in English. Tu luz del mundo bajaste en tinieblas, y ciego ya no fui más. Por tu belleza apenas y adorante, y junto a ti quiero estar. Vengo a adorarte, vengo a postrarme, vengo a decir que eres mi Dios. Tú eres tan hermoso, totalmente digno, tan maravilloso para mí. Kids, um, you're dismissed. You can go ahead and follow your leaders upstairs.
exciting thing is seeing God so much everywhere. And uh, so much to learn from the way other cultures worship, especially. We are uh, continuing, we're concluding our series in on the life of Daniel. We have two more weeks to go, and uh, we're not doing the book of Daniel as such, because the last six chapters have a lot of prophecy in it, and it's pretty heavy, and uh, it's more conducive perhaps to a teaching setting, but we're just looking at the life of Daniel here as well. And Joanne, we just wanted to express our deepest sympathy to you on the passing of your mom and and Marcia as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be part of your worldwide church, the church that Jesus built, that not even the gates of hell can prevail against. And we know that the foundation for that was laid in the Old Testament. And uh, you used specific people to build your kingdom and to give us an example of how we are to live in the most difficult situations when everything seems to be falling apart, just as Daniel did. So speak to us today, Lord, through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't know who they are, but they seem to know what they're talking about. For example, they say that if you have a serious illness, early detection is the best cure. That's what they say, and they are usually right. So if you ignore the symptoms and you live in denial, your condition will probably deteriorate until it's too late. The same scenario applies to troubled marriages. I've counseled with numerous couples who waited too long. By the time they talked to me, their animosity towards each other had metastasized. And it was often too late. Very sad. And the same thing is true for human civilization. A once healthy culture can turn septic with sexual immorality until it becomes terminal. And our health authorities do not hold press conferences to warn us about how contagious sin is or how deadly the consequences are. So we have to figure that out for ourselves. Fortunately, we have a textbook that clearly reveals how to diagnose our condition. The Bible shows us the components of moral and mental health. And it's not complicated. For example, God's prescription for cultural prosperity and individual well-being is summarized in the Ten Commandments. And it was even written on tablets because they didn't have an app for that. So take these two tablets and call me in the morning. That's my prescription. Any culture that ignores these commandments does so at their own peril. Even Canada. Unfortunately, in our society, we've become increasingly decadent to the point that it is now possible to break all Ten Commandments under the full protection of the law because we're smarter than God and we've minimized the consequences. But no culture that defies God's warnings can survive because judgment is coming. And if it is, our number one priority should be to to get ready. Israel wasn't ready. In 587 B.C., most of the leading theologians believed that divine judgment was reserved for the Gentiles. It could never happen to our brand, the children of Abraham. But then the Babylonian battering rams broke through their walls and demolished Jerusalem, including the temple. They weren't ready. And now in 539 B.C., It was Babylon's turn. And the fearsome Persian army had invaded their empire and reached the walls of the great city itself. 
But that's where the enemy's conquest had ground to a halt, at the firewall that no hacker could penetrate. Some say the walls were 300 feet high, 87 five feet wide. Talk about a safe house. No worries here. That's why the current strongman, Belshazzar, the playboy prince, decided he didn't need to double the guards. Instead, he would throw a party, an invasion party. And he invited all the right people, the power brokers, the movers and shakers, the captains of industry, the intellectual elite, all the talking heads, the members of the fashion and arts community, those on the best dress list, the celebrities du jour, the top 40, under 40, the young and the restless, the bold and the beautiful, the fast and the furious, they were all there. It was a social event of the season until it was interrupted by an urgent announcement. Daniel chapter 5, verse 5. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. So the defiant fresh prince of Babylon lay crumpled in a heap on the ground in the fetal position. The party had just turned into an escape room. Now what? Well, I guess we need to decipher the clues and find out what this message is. Verse 7, the king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought. When something supernatural happens, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Let's get the experts in here. They'll know what this means. And he said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made third highest ruler in the kingdom. But there was a problem. Verse 8. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. They consulted their ancient scrolls and manuscripts they looked through the latest edition of Prophecy for Dummies, but Hogwarts Academy did not have a clue. Verse 9, So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale, and his nobles were baffled. Sounds like almost a typical session in the House of Commons on Parliament Hill. Have you noticed how our political leaders are becoming increasingly bewildered by world events? They're getting cynical because there's just not a lot of solutions out there. Verse 10, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. O oh, king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. And so she tells him about Daniel, about how he had interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Verse 12, Daniel was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So by this time, Daniel is over 80 years old which means he was still eligible to run for president. But in Babylon, Daniel was no longer on LinkedIn. Belshazzar didn't have his number on his speed dial. Daniel's ideas had become irrelevant in the brave new world of modern Babylon. Until there was an emergency. A hand had appeared from another realm and had written on the wall. So forget Ghostbusters, who are you going to call? God trusters. Find someone who knows and trusts God. It's interesting how many clergy suddenly appeared on TV after 9 11. And they would broadcast parts of church services instead of talk shows. And prayers are being offered in prime time because when all else fails, ask God. Verse 16. 
Now I've heard that you were able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. It was a most generous honorarium, but Belshazzar's gold had no appeal to a man who was laying up treasures in heaven. 17. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your awards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. So fortunately, Daniel was able to read French. O king, the Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness, glory and splendor. Daniel recognized his father's handwriting, as Donald Campbell put it, and so he proceeds to give Belshazzar a history lesson. All the peoples and nations and men of every language dreaded and feared Nebuchadnezzar. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. The great Nebuchadnezzar had to learn truth the hard way. Verse 21, he was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and, set, and sets over them anyone he wishes. Okay, Daniel, that's probably a good place to stop before you go too far. Read the audience. Because kings weaned on flattery can't stomach much truth, especially when it turns into a public rebuke. No one dares to embarrass the king, or heads will roll. It's getting more and more like that these days. I mean, there are numerous churches in the U.S. where you can't criticize certain politicians or you get into big trouble. But Daniel was not about to dumb down his message. So with divine boldness, he gives Belshazzar the punchline, verse 22. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you've set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. And you praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. In Belshazzar's case, as someone said, pride was a stimulant that became so addictive that it desensitized him from being able to detect sin. Belshazzar didn't feel a thing until he saw the hand. Verse 25, this is the inscription that was written, many, many tekel are sin. I think that's French. This is what the words mean, many. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom will be divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Scholars have identified this uh, writing as terms of weights and measures. Mene means numbered, tekel means weighed, parson means divided. There are also currencies of decreasing value, like a stock that's dropping rapidly on the way to bankruptcy. Quarters, quarters, nickels, pennies. So this is the auditor's report. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. The divine accountant has determined the lifespan of every civilization. 539 B.C., the end of the Babylonian kingdom. 476 A.D., the fall of the Roman Empire. 1945, the termination of the Third Reich. 1989, the dismantling of the Berlin Wall. June 24, 2022, 
The U.S. Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. And that was such a shock because abortion had become one of the pillars of American democracy, along with hot dogs, baseball, NASCAR, and the right to bear arms. And so suddenly, so surprisingly, the pillar collapsed. What's next? Well, maybe in 2025, Heinz Ketchup will close all its factories after Dr. Fauci warns it's a toxic substance. Anything's possible. These things can happen so fast. Like the disintegration of the Soviet Union, I did not see that coming. It took me totally by surprise because the Iron Curtain seemed impenetrable. We didn't know how badly it was rotting from within. The Soviet Union had been our number one enemy for decades. We still remember Khrushchev, who was at the UN, giving a message, taking his shoe off and pounding it on the podium and promising, we will bury you. How many atomic bombs would it take to destroy the Iron Curtain? We had thousands of them. How many bombs would it take? The answer, none. Not even one bullet was fired. Not one bomb was exploded. All of a sudden, Berlin's youth left the nightclubs and were on the wall smashing it with hammers, using the debris for souvenirs. I bought one of those in Seattle. Now, I don't know if it's authentic or not. I'd have to kind of see how it fits with all the other ones. But when a center of gravity was lost, communism's structural integrity was compromised, and all the Tsar's horses and all the Tsar's men couldn't, well, except for that one guy who was sitting on the horse without a shirt. You've seen that picture? Because tyranny abhors a vacuum. And when one empire collapses, there's always another Tsar, another Caesar, with dreams of grandeur waiting for his turn to sit on that empty throne. And just like those before him, he will set himself against the Lord of Heaven. He too will forget to honor God, and he too will suffer the consequences. I say he... Because it's always the men who start the wars, right? Never the women, according to one expert. What's interesting is how this pattern keeps repeating. Human empires become internally weak before they are externally destroyed. Many, many tekel parson. The numbers didn't add up. Babylon looked so impressive, their armies appeared invincible, their walls seemed unbreachable. But when God weighed that empire on the scales of his judgment, its deficiencies became apparent. It didn't measure up, there was little substance, almost as if it was hollow. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. It reminds us of uh, what God said in Isaiah 40, 15. Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. When you weigh yourself, do you make sure that you get all the dust off there first? Because you want to know exactly how much you weigh. You don't want to add anything to it. So make sure that dust is off. There is dust on the scales, absolutely inconsequential to God. Here's Babylon, the bully that loved to throw its weight around. But it was internally weak, it was hollow, and its days were numbered. And of course, when the Persians entered the city, they were sure to encounter fierce resistance. There would be thousands of casualties. Well, not exactly. In fact, uh, they met with almost no resistance. Edward Young writes, Not a spear was thrown when Babylon was defeated. Most of the soldiers were drunk. It was actually several days before the citizens even knew what happened. Did you hear the latest news? 
The Persians have captured the city. Persians? Cool. Let's uh, hope you're an improvement. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom for less than a day, I guess. But it was a last desperate attempt to secure the favor of Daniel's God. Maybe I can still bribe my way out of this danger. At least Belshazzar kept his promise, but so did God. Verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was, Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So what happened? How did this take place? From an engineering standpoint, it should have been impossible. But the Persians didn't batter down the gates or scale the massive walls because it was unnecessary. They found another way in. Babylon was built on the mighty Euphrates River. And during construction, that river was temporarily diverted until the project was finished. So the Euphrates flowed into the city under the walls and then out the other side. Herodotus, the historian, tells us the Persian army did exactly the same thing. They diverted the Euphrates, then entered the city along the riverbed. Nobody expected it. Nobody was prepared. And there wasn't even any resistance. Sometimes that's how it is in life. Events catch us totally off guard. And the Bible says that's how it will be for those who are living in the last days. In his first coming, everything unfolded gradually. It took 30 years before Jesus finally began his public ministry. But his second coming won't be like that. It will happen suddenly when they won't be expecting it. It'll come like a thief in the night. In Matthew 24, where Jesus gives his prophecy, in verse 36, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. The people of that generation weren't expecting judgment because they had plans. There were family functions. They had already booked the venue. A flood? Are you kidding? It hardly rains anymore. That's why we have all these wildfires. There won't be a flood. Although we, we could use the moisture. Judgment comes when you least expect it. Which is where we're at right now in our society. There is nobody expecting judgment. No one's even talking about it. Because they've turned God into an idol. A cosmic Mr. Rogers, where it's always a beautiful day in the neighborhood. God is friendly, loving, and harmless. He would never judge anyone. My wife and I watch Bull in the evening sometime, the courtroom drama, and on one episode they were discussing all the affairs and adultery that was going on, and his wife expressed dismay, and then Bull said, I'm sure that God is fine with all our shenanigans. That's the attitude. That's how people think about it. And if that's true, there won't be any judgment. Our society certainly doesn't expect any divine intervention. 
just like the contemporaries of Noah. And that's why we should be on red alert. Verse 42, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Early on in my ministry, I met a lot of thieves at the penitentiary. And it was fascinating to listen to them as they described how they would do things. Most were quite ingenious. Some were even brilliant. In fact, a prison could be called the University of Breaking and Entry because that's where they learn their trade. By the time they're released, they are graduating with a doctorate in burglary, summa cum laude. Now, I can't remember all their secrets, but I can tell you one thing. They never make appointments. They depend on the element of surprise. But there is one exception. There is someone who will appear suddenly and unexpectedly like a thief, but he doesn't want to surprise you. He wants you to be ready. Jesus won't tell you when, but he wants you to be ready. Not sitting idly like you're waiting for tech support. Your call is important to us. Please stay on the line. There are only 999 people ahead of you. Being ready has nothing to do with idleness. It has everything to do with obedience. If he is to return, what would we do differently than we're doing now? I think one of the best perspectives on this is in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33 and 34, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Unfortunately, we get so busy seeking all the other things that we put God on hold. I can't right now, but let's do lunch. I'll have my people get in touch with your people. Yeah, we'll have lunch this week or maybe maybe next month. But seek first his kingdom. Do not worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Seek his kingdom today. And you are doing that. Good for you. You've come to church. You've worshipped God. You're listening to His Word. You are seeking God today. You're feeding yourself spiritually, adding weight and substance to your testimony. The question is, what about tomorrow? Oh, I'm worried about tomorrow. I may have to go places and do things. I think the number one thing that prevents us from seeking God is often worry. Worry about the future. Because when I have anxiety, it dominates my mind. I can hardly think of anything else. And worry tends to kind of hollow us out. Some people worry so much they, they actually lose weight. So here's an idea. Instead of worrying first and then seeking God, seek God first not fourth or fifth, but first, and then you'll find your problem looks differently. It's put into perspective. Be still and know that I am God. In fact, you may realize that the crisis that you're worrying about may not even be necessary. Because if Jesus returns, then it won't even matter. I think being ready for his return means realizing that worry is unnecessary. In fact, it's 
It's a great impediment to being ready. Because when I worry, I'm not ready. And when I'm worry, when I'm ready, worry is unnecessary. Now, of course, if you have a problem tomorrow, you don't ignore it, you're aware of it, you acknowledge it, and you do your best to resolve it. But you don't get worried. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. Because it's temporary. This problem is causing you so much anxiety. Won't matter 10,000 years from now. And if he returns tonight, it won't even matter tomorrow. Because if he returns, I won't even be on the planet. Which is a big relief because all my problems are on this planet. I have no unresolved conflicts on Mars or financial difficulties on Pluto or health concerns on Saturn. So if I were somewhere else, this problem wouldn't upset me anymore. It's like when you go on vacation, you kind of forget about everything else. It's such a relief. That's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Seek first his kingdom. If Jesus returns tonight, you'll forget all about the problems you had back on that planet. What was that called again? And by the end of the week, you'll be sitting on the porch of your new mansion eating stromboli pizza without a care in the world because the world and its desires pass away. Being ready means seeking first his kingdom. When you're seeking his kingdom, it really doesn't matter when Jesus returns. If you're not seeking his kingdom, if you're sinning, then you don't want him to return at that point. Lord, could you return Sunday morning when I'm at church? Because that's usually when I'm at my best, rather than any other time in the week when it's a lot more risky. Being ready means seeking first his kingdom, not worrying about all the things that won't matter 10,000 years from now. And by then, you won't even remember what you were so anxious about. And you know something? I'm already practicing that. And so are you. If you're like me, I have forgotten most of the problems I had last year. I, I just didn't write them down. So I've forgotten about them. I've even forgotten some of the problems that were worrying me last month. And I think that's a healthy habit. So the final question for a million dollars is, are you ready? Or are you worried? Because you really can't do both. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. Father, we, uh, we realize that it is very possible that we are living in the last days because we live in a culture that is so sinful and yet a culture that has no concept that they could be facing judgment. All they talk about is your love. They don't understand your holiness. So this could well be the time in which you will return. And if it is, we need to be ready. When we see that our culture isn't ready, that's when we should be ready. So, Lord, help us to really focus on seeking your kingdom. Help us to focus on Jesus. He is the one who we fix our eyes on, not all the other things that distract us. And the one who reigns and will reign forever. I pray this in his name. Amen.
so then as we go, uh, just go do this whole thing of Macquarie and try to talk to each other. Uh, and then if you remember the first bit, it's invite you back in to the again, just to make it happen. But as we go today and this week, I would encourage you and invite you to consider what does it look like for you to live in the readiness of safety and connection with each other? What does it look like to, to live with that? participation and participation. Thank you as we go on.